All right, everyone, thanks for joining us. It's Friday, December 1st. It's our final final masterclass of 2023. And we're ending off with a fantastic speaker. We're thrilled to have Dr. Louis uh, Femi Ayani join us today. I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we start. And for those of you that have been joining for the last 12, you'll be well familiar with these. Um, but we will start with just um, a welcome, letting everyone get settled. And we will start with a land acknowledgement and then I'll go over some final uh, housekeeping items. So to begin, uh, we acknowledge that this is sacred land upon which we are privileged to live and work. We recognize a deep connection and longstanding relationship between Indigenous peoples in the land of Southwest Ontario and of London. We acknowledge the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewik, and Chinonton nations whose traditional lands we are gathered upon here today uh, at Western University in London, at least where I am. And we are deeply grateful to have the opportunity to be in this place. And so to start off, just a couple of housekeeping items. We've turned off the chat and we'll be using the Q&A. So one way to use that well is that if you have a question, pop it in anytime. We save the questions and answers until the end of the presentation. So just drop in your question there. If you see somebody else's that you really like, just like it. Essentially, it will upvote it. So the most popular questions get to the top of the line. Uh, and, we'll, uh, and we'll go through that at the very end. We have about a 40 minute presentation and, and anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. The session is being recorded and the masterclass was developed from input from our scientific planning committee. Thanks to Dr. Eric Wong and Dr. Sadia Jan uh, for your assistance. And so I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Dr. Lufemi Ayani is a professor and academic division head of orthopedic surgery at McMaster University. He was recently named the second president-elect of the Canadian Orthopedic Association and is a tier two Canada research chair in joint preservation surgery. With over 400 academic publications, Dr. Ayani is also considered a leading authority in orthopedic joint uh, sport injuries, particularly in hip injuries and conditions. So he's also the medical director for the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the Canadian Football League and Forge FC, which is a Canadian Premier League. And uh, I just want to highlight that it was fantastic to get people's input. So these master classes are designed from uh, input from the primary care physicians, uh, specifically locally and then some abroad. And essentially, it's uh, this was one of the topics that really was one of the most popular topics as voted on by the primary care physicians. Just getting an understanding of how we have about 25 to 30 percent of primary care involves some kind of MSK condition that comes through our doors, uh, but most of us probably have a, a bit of lack of training in our in our med school and uh, residency program. So I'm thrilled to have Dr. Ayani join us today and and walk us through some of that. So welcome. I'm going to turn off my video now, and I will see you at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's great to be um, invited to such a wonderful opportunity to communicate across uh, specialty jurisdictions. And uh, thank you for the very kind introduction as well. Um, you know, I think I've admired the work that uh, Jane has done from a distance in, uh, in Hamilton. And I really uh, give credit to you to really bring up these types of seminars, which really encourage cross specialty talking. And uh, that, that usually is how we solve big problems. So um, I'll try and share my screen. I, I've succeeded so far because I've had my mute button off while I was speaking. So I'm off to a very good start when it comes to Zoom presentations today anyways. But here's my talk and I hope um, everybody could see uh, this well. And uh, I'm getting a bit of a thumbs up, so I'll proceed. So the conversation today is all about joint examination, primary care and what not to miss. And really in the realm of requesting MRIs and orthopedic uh, consultations, I try to make this somewhat evidence-based, but really, um, on experience, been in practice for about 15 years now, really understanding what works and what people are looking for from an orthopedist perspective and, and trying to bridge some of those informational gaps that can occur between specialties. So the um, financial support disclosure is important to mention. Uh, the program received no commercial support, but there was a citywide department of family medicine and family medicine special project fund supporting this. And with regards to conflict of interest, Dr. Jane Thornton has uh, editorial relationships with the British Journal of Sports Medicine, CIHR, Western, Lawson Research, SIRC, and World Rugby. And Dr. Wong uh, is an assessor for CPSO, consultant for Touchstone, medical director for the Thames Family, family uh, Health Team, as well as the University um, Family Health Residency IMG Selection Group. 
Um, he also has some recruitment work with Western and uh, University of Toronto, as well as receiving funding from CIHR and Western. So our presentation will have uh, potential bias uh, with regards to ensuring um, data is presented fairly. And so um, if you do have any questions, please, we try to mitigate it as much as possible. It's important to recognize we all have presentation biases and we try and mitigate that through uh, open disclosure. So my disclosures are that I have a speaking um, bureau with Striker Canada and I'm funded by CIHR and I uh, have a, a mentorship company called uh, Notch Academy. So I think the current process is patient has a problem, goes to primary care, gets worked up, then referred to surgery, and then to physiotherapy or rehab specialist after the fact. And, you know, um, that's at least jurisdictionally uh, biased because in Canada, that's what we see. In other parts of the world, you go to your surgeon right off the bat, you YouTube or Google what you think is wrong with you, and off you go um, getting information online. But increasingly, you know, there are restrictions being placed on going right to a surgeon across the globe, from my, speaking to my colleagues. And, you know, companies, whether they're insurance companies or, um, you know, uh, essentially private uh, healthcare units are asking, do you need to see a surgeon and do you need to have all this advanced imaging? And so I think this paradigm may shift to some degree, but it's important to recognize that this is uh, an important flow that we currently deal with day to day. But that being said, Sorry, Mami, sorry to interrupt. I just see presenter notes, so I don't know if you wanted to put it on presenter slide. Apologies for interrupting there, but no uh, it's okay as is as well, so up to you. Yeah, no, I think the, the other mode is probably better. Okay. Is that different at all? No, it still says, um, at least on my view, um, it still, it shows the, um, uh, kind of the next slide, the no notes, it's pretty small, so you can mostly see the screen, but um, we can, uh, I'm wondering, yeah, because it shows presenter view. Um, let's see. Yeah, maybe if we try again, or I will, that's perfect there. Is that good for you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting, thanks. No worries. Like I said, my other nickname is TJ Ayani for Technical Jam. And so this is uh, the first one so far. But the um, strategy we typically would have is to have one on x-ray, look at fracture work, arthritic conditions, and then after that, move on to MRIs. Of course, their system delays getting an MRIs, but it certainly is very helpful for getting prognostic detail, soft tissue conditions that x-rays cannot delineate, and then it gives us additional detail for imaging. But they're time intensive, and also, you know, very difficult to obtain at times. The ultrasound certainly has uh, increased access. It's faster, certainly can be helpful for specific injuries. However, it is very operator dependent and limited by body habitus. So larger patients do have a bit more difficulty of obtaining accuracy with regards to the ultrasound. So it's very, very user and operator dependent and it's not for every patient. So, Starting off with the shoulder, I think it's important to go from top down. And, you know, I think the mnemonic we all had in medical school was colder, which roughly is quality, onset, location, duration, exacerbating and relieving symptoms. And when you take into medical history, it's important to really obtain that basic and baseline history and then really ask about a history of trauma and quantify the pain as to whether it's severe in nature, what sharpness, what uh, character it has, whether it's sharp or dull where it radiates, which can indicate their neurogenic component to the pain, and then looking for symptoms of instability, such as subluxations, dislocations. And of course, what is the functional impact? So it's one thing to have pain, it's one thing to have a feeling of instability, but is it impactful functionally? When you start to get that functional impact, that's when the ears peak up in an orthopedic surgeon. We really like to hear that, well, this is happening frequently whenever somebody raises their hand, the shoulder subluxes in class, they're a teenager, it's affecting school. So that functional impact is very, very important to direct when you're directing your referral. As well, the physical examination growing from that is really looking at inspection. Good thing is shoulders are symmetrical or should be, and we have two of them. So comparing side to side probably is a very, very effective strategy of identifying if you have some other um, you know, pathological changes that warrant further investigation. 
So looking at deformity, looking at muscle wasting, as you see in that picture, skin changes, any masses or swelling, you can really pick this up when you compare side to side. And it doesn't really help to be dogmatic, but have a system. Be systematic in what you're looking for. You ask the right questions, then you go looking at inspection, and then you go range of motion, and then you palpate, and then you go to your special test. But as long as you have a system you repeat consistently, generally speaking, you will not miss a lot clinically when you are assessing these patients, and your imaging and referral requests will be you know, expedited for the most part because really you are on top of the game and you're really picking out what needs to be um, investigated. Special tests most commonly are for rotator cuff, and you see those mentioned below. Uh, the impingement test, the empty can test, they're all reasonable, not perfect. Some sensitive, not very specific. And these stability tests are also, um, when you do them in triplicate, very helpful, which is your apprehension, relocation, and rebound test, which um, I think we all know about. I think that when you're thinking about referring a shoulder condition, one, look for the red flags clearly, night pain, constitutional symptoms, fever, weight loss. When you have that in the distant shoulder pain, then you get worried about something systemic happening. And then when somebody has neurological complaints, it's always important to make sure that you don't have a concurrent cervical spine condition that is also layering on top of the shoulder condition. So many times it's not everything in isolation. Uh, people don't always present like a textbook where it's an isolated shoulder a problem or you know, uh, cervical spine condition. They can overlap significantly especially when we recognize that rotator cuff disease tends to be a disease that occurs in people who are 50 plus, 60 plus, and that's when, of course, cervical spine symptoms from degenerative changes also develop concurrently. So you can have patients present with both of these symptoms, and when you have somebody presenting with weakness, paresthesias, and other symptoms that seem to be nerve-related, then certainly uh, consider um, referring not just an orthopedic surgeon, potentially to a neurosurgeon and investigating uh, with more... Um, uh, advanced imaging, such as MRI of both systems. Now, referring to the emergency, clearly when you have an x-ray and there's a fracture, if you're concerned about somebody being unwell systemically, you're concerned about an infection or a septic joint, or if somebody's had a dislocation that is unreduced, especially if it's over a day or two, you need to call the emergency department and get that patient to the emergency department to see an orthopedic surgeon. Certainly reductions are difficult to do, but you can get to them and you know be successful uh, with the first several hours. But once you're over a day or two, all the muscles tense up, there's a lot of spasm and pain, and then this becomes a more difficult problem to handle. And oftentimes that will require an open reduction, which is surgical as opposed to a closed reduction. This is for dislocations that are, no, that are now subacute or uh, prolonged in uh, identification and management. So be aware of those. So when to refer, I think that generally speaking, there's increasingly a push to recognize that these first time dislocations are not benign. So one of the predictors of having a recurrent problem in your shoulder is having at a young age, a first time dislocation. So if you have a patient, teenager is dislocated once, maybe even twice, those are folks that sh should be referred to an orthopedic surgeon because the more dislocations they sustain, the more likelihood of certainly soft tissue and bony damage, making the further orthopedic intervention very challenging. So an early orthopedic consultation is warranted in somebody who's unstable and has documented dislocations. And there's always been a debate about what type of MRI to order. If you do have access to a three Tesla magnet, most of the time you will get sufficient detail to inform an orthopedic surgeon. Now, if you do have a 1.5, not a three, but a 1.5 Tesla magnet, then the arthrogram is usually very helpful as an adjunct to help clarify and delineate soft tissue damage. So 3.0, no, 1.5, yes, with our program. That's our local standard and increasingly what we're seeing and hearing about globally about what the best MRI is for these conditions. And I think it's important that uh, you recognize that difference because increasingly patients do not want the arthrogram for multiple reasons. And especially in that teenage population or adolescents who are younger, they may not want to go for the arthrogram, but as long as you have a 3T magnet, that usually is fine. Clearly, if you find a soft tissue or bony lesion, Referral is important urgently. And then when you have overuse injuries and the x-rays are certainly not helpful and there's been a failure of conservative or non-operative management, then you may consider moving on to more advanced imaging. But for somebody who has an overuse injury with minimal discomfort, not limited, sees you in clinic, you've seen them for three, four, five, six months at that point, and you still have symptoms that are unexplained, it may be uh, important to consider advanced imaging. And I would recommend that's a good time to consider an MRI or even at least an ultrasound. So rotator cuff tears certainly are common. Um, you know, 
you start to develop these senescent type changes. Everybody does in their late 40s, early 50s, and they can be progressive from partial tears. If you look at natural history, a certain segment of the population will have a partial tear, and then over time develop full tears, and then bilateral rotator cuff problems. And that really starts late 40s, early 50s, and progresses to your 70s as far as the presentation. With that being said, they are very common. It's important to roll out an x-ray to make sure there are no lesions or any um, <clears throat> recipient fractures. And then an ultrasound can be operator dependent, but quick to obtain. Ultrasounds are very helpful for rotator cuff problems, not so much for labral tears. There are some specialty groups that may have that expertise, but it's not very common. And if you have a clinical examination documenting significant weakness, then an MRI can certainly be very, very helpful to not only de determine where the location of the injury is in the rotator cuff tendon, but also reparability as well as the acuity of it. So when you have an MRI of a shoulder in somebody who has had pain for several months, has failed an operative treatment, an MRI will help with one, where is the problem? So which tendon's involved? Is there any atrophic changes? Are there any fat changes? And those are all um, very important prognostic details that a surgeon will obtain because a rotator cuff that is full thickness and not retracted, that's very repairable and successful most of the time. But once you start to introduce atrophy, fat changes, tendon tissue being attenuated, those now become procedures that may require tissue augmentation, special strategies in surgery. So that gives us additional detail that's very, very helpful. So I think that um, modest response to a full thickness tear, if you've documented that with your first line of imaging, maybe an ultrasound, is one whereby if you start to notice weakness, specifically difficulty with elevation or rotation compared to the uninjured side, that is when you're looking at an MRI to be very helpful at helping a surgeon uh, determine next three steps. So that would be an indication for it. So what about the um, medical history of the knee? Well, similar strategy as far as having that systematic history and really documenting where the pain is, the location, the triggers, and really understanding if it has an association with instability, a history of dislocation, swelling, and a number of events. And of course, functional impact is very important. When you have somebody specifically complaining or presenting with patellar instability, always good to document the number of episodes and number of ER visits because that certainly helps quantify the degree of functional deficit or functional difficulty for the patient. So understanding once more, documenting the location, the triggering events, what exacerbates it, and then moving on to understand, is that person now engaging in the system, the healthcare system, multiple times? That is very, very helpful. On your examination, inspection, palpation, range of motion tests, and then special tests are always very important. And I think you, um, for the examination, want to do this in a relaxed patient. So in the acute setting, when somebody is acutely injured on a field or sideline, it's very hard to do a whole slew of, of tests. So you should go to your go-to one or two tests and really just do a gentle lock one or a gentle stress test to look for varus or vagus instability. And those you know, uh, one or two tests can be very, very helpful in identifying the uh, clinical um, scenario you're dealing with. So I think that sometimes um, people want answers very quickly, especially athletes on the sideline. And you can just, in the setting of somebody who's in pain, do the best you can by doing the one or two go to tests that can be very helpful. Red flags, not dissimilar to what we discussed in the shoulder. So really looking at constitutional symptoms, those are very concerning. And of course, you do some screening blood work, maybe investigate other systems. But specific to the knee is looking at the scenario of a locked knee with an inability to extend or flex the knee and associated neurological symptoms. It's always important, um, and I'll repeat this again, always important to examine the joint above and below, especially in pediatric patients. A pediatric patient, 100% of the time, if you hear about a knee problem, check the hip. There's always one story or one patient a year who is being worked up for a meniscus tear who actually had a capital femoral epiphysis. So in pediatric patients specifically, their hip pain radiates to the knee, and you can be tricked into thinking this is an urgent knee condition and miss the hip. Certainly uh, an irreducible fracture or dislocation, anytime you have neurovascular compromise, severe lacerations with joint exposure, a septic joint or lock knees are urgent referral um, you know, rationale that will be well supported. So any of these scenarios where you're concerned about the joint being compromised, being exposed to foreign matter, that is one where you really want to get an urgent referral to the emergency department, have the orthopedic uh, surgeon on call be notified, and that is uh, something that should be done, and it probably is done in most centers. When it comes to referral, well, 
if you do have an intraarticular or extraarticular ligament injury, it is important to get an orthopedic opinion. Even a condition like an MCL rupture, whether it's partial or full, there will be questions about return to sport in the athlete or healing potential. And so those that are even felt to be benign do warrant some orthopedic input. And I think that when you have somebody with patella femoral instability, especially if recurrent, an orthopedic referral and an MRI is prudent. You can diagnose an MPFL or medial patella femoral ligament injury, any associated chondral injuries of the patella, if this is recurrent or even trochlea, and then can really give some good prognostic detail for your surgeon to work with. The ACL, well, some will say you don't need an MRI, and that certainly with a good clinical examination is good to, uh, to potentially bypass if you can get into a specialty clinic that has a high skill level. There are associated injuries that are concurrent, meniscus, cartilage, they can be missed in these scenarios. So, you know, the more information you have, the better, but there are some centers that will simply go on clinical imaging, clinical testing, and basic imaging such as x-ray, which could be very, very pathomonic for the condition. But in our center, we would obtain an, an MRI to identify several prognostic factors. If the patient is non-ambulatory, not weight-bearing, not weight and has an active effusion, specifically with that plant pivot and pop mechanism, we generally would recommend an MRI to, deline to delineate the conditions we're uh, dealing with. And of course, once more, we have two more on every slide because once a year, just like clockwork, we always seem to pick up a random osteosarcoma that we didn't expect and we thought this was knee pain from a meniscus. So it doesn't hurt to get that primary screening x-ray, make sure we rule things out and then move on to the specialty tests. Um, certainly, I would say that if somebody does have a basic x-ray, osteoarthritis, especially if it's moderate to severe, going down the pathway of an MRI is not very helpful because the interventions that you may require um, with severe or moderate to severe arthritis do not require MRI imaging. Generally speaking, you're looking at potentially non-surgical management or if surgical management is warranted, a joint replacement. And you would not necessarily need an MRI to determine if you need to have a total knee replacement. MRI typically is for soft tissue injuries, ligamentous injuries, those amenable to arthroscopic interventions, which arthritis is not. Moving on to the hip um, or back up to the hip, um, same cascade of questions and really looking at feelings of instability, mechanical symptoms associated with this, and really recognizing that you can have overlaying symptoms again with sciatica, low back pain or urinary symptoms and quantifying the functional impact is also very, very helpful. When you see somebody with this problem, especially in a pediatric, as you see in that x-ray, just remember one more time, the hip pain can raise to the knee and always examine the joint above and below, especially in pediatrics, very, very important. And location of the discomfort is very important to rule out um, having any lumbar sacral involvement triggering the hip and or groin pain. So this is what uh, we see. It's not always so clear cut. You can see one mild slip and one chronic slip. Um, and that's more uh, acute. The more chronic is in the frog view. And then the standard AP view, you can see a very, very, very subtle slip uh, on that left hip. So it's not always um, evident, but certainly when a pediatric patient shows up, always think with knee pain, this could be a, an acute or a chronic slip capital femoral epiphysis. So I think that when you're thinking about the hip, just recognize that anybody presenting with hip or groin pain, there's a specific architecture to the joint some have not enough bone or dysplasia, where you see there's not enough coverage for the femoral side of the uh, joint. And then some have too much bone, as you see with impingement or FAI, and they have too much bony prominence, and that causes friction, collision, and then some early degenerative changes. Like most conditions, there's always a bell curve distribution. Most of us are in the middle somewhere, but people will have, um, at the extremes, symptomatic conditions where there's insufficient bony availability or coverage, or too much uh, bony development or overgrowth. And that's where the symptomatic patients typically will come to a surgeon's office. So when you get your hip x-ray, just look for those terms, looking and diagnosing what the structural or the architecture of the hip is that may have induced or caused a labral tear. So it's not enough to simply say labral tear be success. It really is very, very helpful to say labral tear in the setting of a normal hip, labral tear in the setting of dysplasia, or labral tear in the setting of impingement. That's very, very helpful and really helps us triage our referrals. So I think that along those lines, impingement of the hip is increasingly being recognized as a condition that can cause young pain, cause pain in the young adult hip, 
that is sometimes pre-arthritic in nature, and we're recognizing it more and more. So patients understand it as a square peg, round hole phenomena. It's not exactly that, but it gives them an understanding as to why they can have pain, because that increased friction, increased contact can eventually lead to senescent changes such as cartilage loss, labral damage, and eventually some select patients, degenerative changes such as osteoarthritis. So I think that we're seeing more of it and people ask why is it an epidemic? I would say that we have better um, technology for imaging. We have more astute and aware clinicians. Our treatments are certainly improving. And so, and the demand with patients knowing what it is, is increasing. So prior to this in training, I would have seen 10 knees for every hip or 10 shoulders for every hip. Now you're seeing the presentation of hip and groin conditions rising up um, almost at rates where we anticipate in the next 10 to 15 years will be as common as shoulder injuries. So I think that why it's important is some people are concerned that some of these hip injuries may lead to arthritis. And our paper showed years ago that yes, there are select individuals, especially when the femoral head is prominent, that may develop osteoarthritis. We don't know who exactly, but there seems to be a relationship between activity, developing a large femoral head, having that CAM type morphology like you see in that schematic, and eventually bleeding on to developing arthritis in select patients, but not everyone. I think why it's important to do a good physical exam is because the hip has multiple pain generators that can really um, you know, confound things. So your differential diagnosis is vast. Groin pain could be musculoskeletal in nature. It could be genitourinary in nature. It could be gynecological, neurologic, and abdominal. So classically, core muscle injuries, previously known as sports hernias, were a big deal. And now we're recognizing that perhaps, you know, 25% of those with FAI or hip impingement and labral tears may have core muscle injuries that are significant as well. So really, as our understanding is developing, we're understanding that many of these symptoms overlap each other. And the reason is oftentimes when you don't have enough hip rotation through the joint because you're impinging, you rotate through your trunk and you start to have really abdominal wall injuries that can present with core muscle or sports hernia type presentations. So I think that your examination should be, just like the others, very, very systematic, a standing examination, seated, supine, lateral decubitus, and prone. And if you have a system that you go through most of the time, just like the uh, pilots do, the chances are you're not going to miss much in your diagnostic pathway. So just have a system, whichever exams you use is fine, but certainly just have a system that you see a patient with a groin injury, a hip injury, you do the same sequence most of the time. For the sake of time, we will not go through every single physical exam maneuver, but I think you get the point that having a system is very uh, important. So I think that diagnostic imaging is quite helpful, standard x-rays, MRI, three test lab, no arthrogram is required, but if it's a 1.5, consider that. CT scans are somewhat controversial because of the radiation risk. We don't use it typically, but there are some low-dose protocols emerging, which should be like an x-ray times two, which is fine. Ultrasound can be helpful to rule out abdominal or core muscle injuries, and then a diagnostic injection can also be very, very helpful. So, you know, understanding x-rays, understanding that um, certainly when it comes to understanding the hip, AP views are good, and done views really are very, very helpful. And that's done, as you see, almost like a frog lateral view, and that really helps you identify the shape of the hip, especially the femoral head and neck junction. So understanding AP and done views can be very important. And then moving on to your MRI is important. Now, the diagnostic challenge could be this. We see different things. We had a study years ago looking at the agreement between radiologists and orthopedic surgeons. And you can see the agreement is anywhere from 15 to 33%. So sometimes when patients show up with imaging that says, well, this is just a labral tear, nothing else is you know, ongoing as a fundamental or a structural deformity, oftentimes the orthopod may disagree. And so as we have these types of sessions, they're so important so that we can cross communicate and understand our perspectives so that we can really have enhanced communication. So just a decade ago, we would get reports most of the time where we would say, no, 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 to the patient, you actually have this condition. And the question is, well, why wasn't that identified by my primary care doctor? Or how come the imaging says this doesn't have to occur? So I think when we start to have these sessions and discussing how we see things, and what we look for, that really helps us. So when you see these patients with groin pain and you've done your physical examination and you now have imaging showing um, you know, potential impingement, and then you go to the MRI for structural damage in the hip joints, which is a labral tear, that really is the cascade of tests you want to move through 
And that's very, very helpful. And understanding that whenever you see these problems, just don't think labor alternative only, but look at also the structural issues that may contribute to it. And that's very helpful. When it comes to other non um, or extra articular impingement scenarios, they're growing all the time. You can evolve any growing part of the bone in the young athlete, but increasingly we're seeing subspine impingement. And that is when you evolve your anterior periliac spine. It's a growing area in teenagers play soccer, et cetera. And they'll feel a sudden pop when they extend the hip and then you have that evolution. And um, that's when you can have bony overgrowth like you see in the x-ray and can cause secondary impingement. For subspine impingement testing, we test maximum flexion and ask the patient for a painful response to the terminal range of motion. So that's how we test subspine impingement. That's sort of uh, the newer and the best of what we got is sensitive, not specific. But a patient with direct hip flexion pain, be aware that that could be somebody who has some subspinous prominence. When you have impingement, they tend to have more pain with rotational maneuvers. And when you have subspine prominence, it's a direct flexion. And that's usually sensitive, although not specific. So, of course, you know, pediatric patients, um, they're very different. They're not young adults. And a 14-year-old is not a 14-year-old. They all look differently. And really having an understanding of their growth and development, tanner staging, that's always good to have a chart in your office. Because when somebody is a, a pediatric or adolescent patient, having pain beyond six to 12 weeks is very atypical. And that's when you should really be concerned about, is this an overuse injury? Is this somebody who's playing too much, you know, parental pressures, et cetera, et cetera. They all exist. And we see patients all the time with those issues. And the question is when to refer. But once you hit that six week timeline of ongoing discomfort with no resolution of symptoms, that's when you get some basic imaging. At 12 weeks, we would say, okay, this is not typical for a 10 year old to have three months of shoulder pain or knee pain or hip pain. And that's when you used to go down the pathway of where is this patient at the area as far as growth and development, physiologically, where are things lying? And then where do we have to think about? Because a lot of the conditions we see are age-based. What are we thinking is going on here? And what imaging that is required to move things ahead? I think it can be difficult, especially um, in young children, because they don't want to let their coaches down, their parents down. Sometimes when we see patients who have a pediatric practice as well, oftentimes they will not say, especially adolescents, will not want to admit to having pain, but certainly they will admit to having stiffness or you know, feeling that, well, there's something that's clicking. But the second you ask about pain, again, out of fear of letting their teammates down, their coaches down, their parents down, they'll say it doesn't hurt. But if somebody's coming to your, pra to your practice and they're presenting with you know, obvious discomfort and you can see them once you your physical examination, that's when you should really consider going to imaging. And then based on your findings and concerns, refer. Always, again, with the red flags, please, um, it doesn't hurt to ask any fever, night pain, uh, disturbed sleep, weight loss, things that we all ask about, but sometimes in a busy clinic, we just think, oh, looks healthy, and let's just move through that. And of course, now, understanding that cascade of instability lives in a spectrum, and looking at bait and screening, looking for joint hypermobility, that's increasingly becoming very, very important, because many patients have, you know, <clears throat> live on that spectrum of not maybe not having a full connective tissue disorder, such as an ehlers downloads, but have, you know, uh, tendencies to have joint mobility, which may predispose them to having joint injuries. So screening that is very important in the pediatric patient. I think um, we'll go through uh, a few pediatric conditions and some of the imaging that we'd recommend. Rotator cuff issues, typically not an issue in pediatric patients. Again, that's something you see late 40s, early 50s, but do think about instability. Think about overuse, especially if you see x-ray findings and physis, and think about muscle type injury. So Shoulder pain in the pediatric patient tends to be overuse in nature. When it comes to the elbow, pain and stiffness, mechanical symptoms, that really helps you identify somebody who may have um, a capitellum chondral defect, and it's not a tennis elbow again in this population. So sometimes we layer the diagnosis in adults on kids, and tennis elbow, rotator cuff, those don't commonly appear in the pediatric athlete or young adult. Little leaguer shoulder, not uncommon again, overuse, typically adolescent, overhead athletes, pitchers, quarterbacks, they'll have pain antilaterally. You can see the arrows showing the widening of the physis as well as sclerosis, and pain is reproduced with a provocative movement. And it's important to make sure that um, rest, rest, rest is, is uh, prescribed. And when you see changes like physis widening, sclerosis along the metaphysis of the um, proximal humerus, you don't have to go to an MRI for that. That's a pretty clear diagnosis. 
And then you may have to bring that patient into a room by him or herself and ask, what are you doing and how much of it is going on? And then you'll get an understanding that this is somebody who is at a super exposure level for their sport, for their age, and they're playing on two different teams and three different leagues and two all-star games, et cetera, et cetera. And those are people and young people that get into troubles with their joints. Transient synovitis, septic hip. Well, transient synovitis is a mimicker, but certainly you want to make sure that you um, refer, if you have any concern about somebody who's limping, is not weight-bearing, has had a history of a fever. Uh, those are all things that if you have any suspicion of a septic joint, please um, consider calling your ER and referring that patient. Looking at the knee in the pediatric patient uh, and then looking at the conditions they will present with typically to your clinics and offices, also convexes the seconds can really be, um, you know, one that presents with vague symptoms and always hard to diagnose without MRI imaging. But a referral to an orthopedic surgeon is warranted if you do diagnose that because they can become unstable. They may need surveillance over time. And if you have a pediatric patient with knee pain, an x-ray showing an osteochondral lesion, that I think is warranted as far as referring to an orthopedic surgeon. And an MRI imaging can be helpful to really assess stability, give prognostic detail, and help for surgical planning. If you have Auschwitz lattice disease, that is typically an apophysitis of the tibial tubercle, and you'll feel the enlarged tubercle, it'll be painful to palpate, and x-rays are helpful and confirmatory treated non-surgically the vast majority of cases and don't require MRI imaging. When it comes to the patella instability, history is important. And when somebody has had a history of recurrent instability, that is when we tend to really think about MRI imaging because that can be very, very helpful as well as a referral to determine whether or not this person has ligamentous disruption, attenuation, and a um, potential for requiring surgical stabilization. More about that again, the hip we talked about. Please, we're seeing these young people more and more, but always examine, you know, the joint above and below. Um, when somebody presents with a C sign, like you see, they cut their hands like a C, grab the hip and groin, we can identify that they may have a joint problem. And especially in Canada with the um, hockey culture we have, meaning that a lot of young children are playing or adolescents are playing hockey, we see a lot of young people now, um, you know, showing up with injuries that are subtle in nature, they can be identified with good physical examination. They don't all need surgery, but certainly a good imaging with an AP and done view. And then if you have pain that is not subsiding with rest, non-operative treatment, MRI can be very, very helpful and a referral to an orthopedist. So I think, you know, um, in wrapping up, we're looking to impact practice. And I think this is why this seminar was put together, really to just get an understanding of what we look for, what we get concerned about. Clearly, constitutional symptoms are important pain that is, you know, um, beyond the time from what we expect is important. Young pediatric patients that present like tendinopathies are important because really they aren't. And recognizing that having a systematic examination done above and below being important are some of the key features. I would say that it's important to um, understand why to refer and when to get advanced imaging like MRI because wait times are only um, increasing. And I don't really see that changing anytime soon. And so, the surgeons and the clinicians have to triage based patients based on medical need. And certainly you can advocate for your patients if you have a good history, a good physical examination and imaging supporting a condition that may need an operation. We do know that there's a lack of standardized criteria for consultations and MRIs. And so the future really will be looking at AI tools to help us diagnose conditions and refer better. And, and that'll certainly come as well as the classic guidelines and best practice uh, documents and CME events like this to really increase our education and communication across specialties. But I think that's great because this sort of seminar is very helpful, at least getting the conversation started about what we look for, what we're concerned about, some red flags, when to refer, when MRIs are helpful. So I think that, yep, there are barriers to changing uh, our current systems. Some of them are geographic availability of expertise, uh, patient preference, because patients more than ever are very educated and have their own preferences of who they want to see, what kind of scan they want, and they may not always be available in their jurisdiction. So that places a lot of additional pressure for you as a clinician to try and, you know, figure out the best way forward when, you know, what's available locally uh, may not be the patient's preference, but it's certainly a discussion and a negotiation that happens every day in every clinic. So I think that um, history and physical remains fundamental. Uh, X-rays as a first line, certainly with two views, are very important. Advanced imaging can be helpful. The ultrasound has limitations in that it's operator dependent and not for every body habitus. 
but it is faster. And the MRI, of course, is increasingly being seen as a gold standard for more intraarticular conditions. Really avoid the um, chronic MSK pain treatment with opioids. Please refer along if somebody's having you know, a presentation of chronic symptoms. And if there's still a doubt about the diagnosis, it doesn't matter to ask. It doesn't really hurt to ask for help. And sooner better than later, uh, you can always call somebody and say you're concerned about one of your patients. And a surgeon typically will be reasonable enough, I hope, to say, yeah, I'll listen to that because you are concerned, you call me. And that conversation can go a long way to advocate for your patient if you find they're being sort of bogged down in the system and not getting that access. A call can go a long way. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, and I think that um, we approach things differently. Evidence-based medicine is certainly part of the pivotal uh, nature of what we um, what we do. And although it wasn't an evidence-focused talk, more practical, uh, a lot of these tests and strategies are based on that evidence-based um, strategy and paradigm. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Femi. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate going through all of those things. And and it's just, as you said, I mean, with these different conversations between specialties, we can improve, I think, care for the patient ultimately, and also understand the system a little bit more, because I think one of the things, you know, getting back into practice and out into the world and realizing that so much of our barriers to practice are likely administrative or not being able to have these kinds of conversations and understanding, as you said, the, the best practice guidelines and things like that, not being able to keep up on everything, so to speak. So I, I really appreciate that particularly as we say that there's so many presentations that come into primary care about MSK issues. Um, and, and I also really do appreciate the pediatric point of view because uh, we do see it's quite different. And I know there's been a lot of questions over the years in terms of how we, how we might uh, change our practice a little bit better from a primary care standpoint, primary care sports medicine, which is what I do, but in the sense of really um, having that, that specialist view is from your perspective is, is really key. Um, so I'm going to start with a question. So I uh, I see a question here from uh, Nisha Aurora. So there's a couple of questions so far. Okay, we're getting some more in. Um, so Nisha is asking if it's a full thickness tear. So going back to shoulder. So if it's a full thickness tear confirmed on shoulder ultrasound or MRI, do all of these go to a surgeon? What if they're older? What if it is subacute? What is the age and time cut off? And I usually suggest physio first, refer if no better after six weeks. So I, I don't know if you'd be willing to, and she's saying, I will clarify more non-traumatic shoulder pain. So um, yeah, I don't know if you have a comment on that, or if you'd like me to. Yeah, no, I mean, I um, one good question uh, I'd like to ask patients when they present with shoulder pain, rotator cuff uh, pathology is, is it bad enough to consider surgery? And if the patient says no, then I say, okay, let us try a comprehensive course of non-surgical management. And then at that point, um, I'll say, hey, listen, like non-surgically, our goal here is to reduce pain, increase function. We may not get it back to a normal shoulder, but a better one. And uh, let's see how far we go. So I think that um, there is no age cutoff. It's just more the function of the impact on the patient. And the first question can be, you know, the diagnosis, of course, you know, a bit of information is this is the problem. But if you ask them about the willingness to do surgery and there is no willingness to do that, Run off the bat, that'll save you a lot of time and effort. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, we have Ahmed uh, Nasser who is asking uh, regarding lower back pain problems. Why do most doctors prefer to order an MRI as a primary intervention? Well, <laughs> maybe not in our practices, but no. it's a good question. I don't know if you have a comment on that. Yeah, no, lower back pain, very, very common mechanical back pain with no neurological symptoms. So, you know, just it hurts in the back, they point there, and then there's no radiation, it's all localized. I don't think an MRI is the first step, especially um, you'll potentially find asymptomatic age-related changes. And mm -hmm. once a patient, you know, uh, has that information, it becomes very, you know, very, very daunting and very scary because naturally you get that information, then you go online, and then at that point, you're in the world of information that sometimes is unfiltered and uh, concerning. So I would say that um, anybody presenting with focal back pain, therapy certainly is a first line, uh, non opioid based uh, anti-inflammatory management, exercise and active-based treatments, that would resolve the vast majority of these. And only those with sustained symptoms or you know, really prolonged and those with neurological symptoms need to go down the MRI pathway and seen a surgeon. So I think what you're doing is great in asking why are they all getting MRIs because they really shouldn't. Uh, they should be getting, you know, the standard of, of treatment, which is which is non-surgical and, and exercise-based, um, you know, therapies. Yeah, that's great. And on Ahmed, to that point, I know in, in primary care sports medicine, often we're told to 
uh, essentially wait six weeks or so at least. I mean, and, and that's usually what I tell my patients is that, you know, in six weeks, most of you will get better. So about 90, 95%. So it's a quite a good uh, yeah. statistic. If they can manage, of course, it's uh, understanding their where their pain is at. And that's real. Six weeks can seem like an eternity in, in that much pain. But uh, to your point, I, I think it's a good one that we, we, uh, we have some choosing wisely guidelines and things like that to avoid unnecessary tests. And and uh, as Dr. Ayani has suggested, there's there's quite a few um, uh, things that can pop up on imaging that can sometimes become a, a label that can sometimes be detrimental to people. So I, I completely get that and appreciate the question. Um, Jason's asking, Jason Dasima, hopefully I'm saying your name correctly, is, is asking, um, so chronic MSK pain without surgical indication is a common presentation in primary care. Uh, you mentioned avoiding opioids, and you have any other suggestions for management? This is a this is a good question and a common one. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, you know specialties such as you know physical therapists are very helpful, and both local pain modalities they can use on a therapy level, as well as um, you know uh, other allied healthcare professionals, but. You know, there's a reason why I, this is becoming its own specialty in pain medicine because um, even a short dosage of opioids, a certain percentage will become, you know, dependent on those. So um, orthopedic surgeons being, you know, the predominant prescribers of them in the past, at least historically, the numbers can be up to one in seven or one in eight may end up having a long-term dependency. So that's a big, big number. And so that's why we're really moving away from, you know, creating that uh, that, that issue. And of course, a lot of the drugs, if not used, become a reservoir for um, use on uh, children. Other people get access to it at some point in time. So I think that um, if you're treating somebody who's having difficulty in pain management and you've exhausted your course of therapies, I think really trying to get them into the hands of a pain specialist who can not only prescribe safely, but have the surveillance and the weaning protocols and the expertise is what I like to do to get my pain colleagues involved and say, hey, this is really something we need a long-term strategy on. And they are very usually very helpful. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so Matt Heitzelman is saying that, thank you for the presentation as a physiotherapist. I appreciate your clarity and language using the phrase non-surgical care instead of conservative care. It's, it's, it's a really nice point. So I think that's more of a point than a question, but um, it, it makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does because, you know, um, that yeah, just words matter. <laughs> so yeah, non-surgical, you know, you know, people then recognize, you know, I, I used to have a mentor, who would tell me that there, there are really two types of pain, you know, surgical and non-surgical. And non-surgical does mean it can get better robustly and have good outcomes too, and surgical as well. So they're both equal in, in their ability to help you. So phrasing it that way really helps people understand, as opposed to the conservative where people say, well, I'm still an athlete. I don't want to be conservatively treated. I want to be like Tom Brady. So, you know, <laughs> or, or whoever, you know, Christine Sinclair. Yeah, so right. people say, yeah, you know, just because I'm 40 plus means I, I'm not stopping. So that, a lot of things that um, with the nomenclature really helps people, you know, um, get on board with your plan. Excellent. Absolutely. So Nisha, thank you for your clarification. I'm seeing that just to follow up on her shoulder question. So this is as from the first. So my question comes from a prior understanding that the tissues might be too friable to repair properly if over a certain age or surgery, surgery will be less successful after a certain amount of time. So this is what I was getting at. So um, if someone's function is impaired and they may be interested in surgery, how quickly should we refer? How much should we advocate for the patient? Um, and and I, to, come, to come back to this, because I think there's an underlying, and we see this in sports medicine as well, is that question of when, Anisha, and hopefully I'm encapsulating some of it as well, but when to, when to refer and when to get imaging. And often in our Canadian healthcare system, when the image, especially coming from maybe a non-surgeon, um, can be quite delayed. And so it's that question of how best to advocate for, for a patient with the understanding that there may be risk factors that might affect whether or not you would want to take that consult in the first place. So um, I, I don't know if there was a, if you had any kind of considerations to add on to that as well, but. Yeah, I mean, clearly uh, the, the person, I think Nishan who asked the question has seen uh, a lot of these patients and has, you know, ask the difficult questions if you go to you know any major orthopedic meeting these are the sources of debates where you have experts kind of discuss when and how and, and when is too far so that's an outstanding question i think that you know age certainly is a consideration but not so much that is more comorbidities as far as what are the other health conditions that may impact successful repair um so there's some things there uh but more importantly it's tissue quality so 
if you look at an MRI and you see that they talk about fatty atrophy, tissue attenuation, retraction, multiple tendon involvement, those are problems that probably are in the, or moving quickly into the irreparable category. And then you're starting to think about, is this replacement territory or arthroplasty? So I think mm -hmm. that question is great. Um, the MRI findings are very, very helpful. Um, so that, that's one thing. And then um, I would say that, you know, how do you advocate for your patient? I think if you send this referral with the details uh, on, you know, patient is, let's say, 70 with significant, you know, discomfort with day-to-day -day use and declining function with x-rays showing arthritic changes and an MRI showing massive cuff tear, irreparable or atrophic changes, back changes, any orthopod will see that that has that specialty and say, okay, this is somebody that's functionally impacted. I'll triage that differently. So I think right. that if you're trying to access the system, the more pro more technical detail you can provide in the history, physical, and imaging, that would be certainly very helpful and should be very helpful. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes what you will get is shoulder pain, please assess, but then the MRI findings are excellent, but it's sent in the back of the uh, referral. So by the time you flip through pages, you know, but if it's right there front and center, just that simple strategy of saying, hey, this is impactful, it is, you know, you know, uh, limiting and it is significant. Seeing that for you know front off the bat is, is usually something I would say will help you elevate your patient profile to be in mm -hmm. triage with somebody you should be seeing quickly. And that, I think that's an excellent answer. And it's interesting. It really resonates with some of the one of our first speakers was a sports radiologist, so Dr. Bruce Forrester at UBC. And the the question too about that idea of really making it as specific as possible for the referral really, really helps with in terms of advocacy for your patient and also yeah. appropriate triaging in the sense of knee pain, please assess, or shoulder pain, as you say, yeah. um, really trying to put everything as possible in that comment uh, line and, and help with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so two, one quick question, and then I'll, and I'll fi we'll final, finalize with uh, a last question on pediatric um, conditions. But the, the first one you'd mentioned, and this is quite helpful for me too, actually, because I think it's very center dependent, but that aspect of three Tesla MRI being sufficient if you're trying to look at labral involvement in the shoulder, you'd mentioned 3T MRI versus um, 1, 1. 1.5. That's when you might want to think about arthrogram. Um, a quick question about that. Do you, would you think the same for the hip or is it is it slightly different? Yeah, the same for the hip, I would say. And, yeah. um, you know, like anything else, once a patient or a community has access to a three Tesla magnet, then they'll typically say, well, my friend didn't have the needle, so I don't want that either. Right. <laughs> it's becoming the gold standard. I was talking to one of our radiology colleagues where even the trainees are not getting as much experience in arthrograms because it's moving in that direction. Yeah. Well, and it seems to be a different wait time as well in, in some centers. So yeah. uh, that's that's really useful information. Um, so lastly, I'll finish up. Nisha, thank you. You've been incredible for engagement here today. <laughs> it made my job easy. Um, but one question. So just to follow up on the pediatric standpoint. So assessing. So do you have any suggestions on assessing imaging pediatric patients who have pain, but not at the time of the exam? So interesting coming, coming up with uh, maybe some aspects of who's in the room with them at the time, but who knows? The pain is only for a few hours after dance or the day after hockey or limp that comes and goes, but none of these symptoms or findings are present at the time of the medical visit. Is there value in imaging or referral at that time? Do we wait to ask them to come back when the symptoms are back? Great question, Nisha. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I, what I tend to do now is use technology as a, a, to my advantage. And I'll tell, you know, when you have those symptoms, have your patient, your, your mom or dad or parent, sibling that's old enough and has consent, record it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd say, you know, you have your smartphone, your device. When you finish that game and you're limping, um, have your parents, you know, just take a little 30 second video and bring it with you. And, you know, of course, we, we get consent to see what is happening and what the triggering events are. And that can kind of give a sense of the mechanism as well. So a lot of parents now will bring game footage of this is how my son or daughter got hit. This is what mm -hmm. happened. This is, so that's really becoming a game changer in diagnostics. So we do have those static images because you may get an MRI or x-ray showing nothing as well. But then when you see it dynamically, um, that's more helpful. And there are some centers who will say, hey, listen, you have pain. We can't identify it right now. Let's go to the back with our AT and have you recreate movements on the field and see if that will mm -hmm. induce your pain. So I think those dynamic tests, those abilities um, to use technology to really capture the acute, you know, reactions to certain, you know, physical stimuli, those are things that will become increasingly absorbed in practice. Excellent. And do you find that, I mean, this question will come up to you from primary care is, um, 
whether or not you would image both, so both joints, so particularly in pediatric patients in, in sense of growth plates and so on, do you tend to image bilaterally when you're getting images or is it, I mean, I'm sure it's dependent on presentation, but. It is present on, uh, on, dependent on presentation for sure, but I have a low threshold to, to do a bilateral scan to mm -hmm. see what's going on. And, um, and parents are usually very amenable and agreeable to that as well. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. We're going to have to wrap up there. Um, Dr. Annie, thank you so much. It's it's such an honor and privilege to have you on and uh, fantastic speaking, very clear and very applicable to clinical practice. And as you said, it was exactly the kind of, um, you know, you'd mentioned that we want some interdisciplinary talks and things like that. It is very clinically focused um, with the sprinkling of evidence base, which is also certainly in your presentation as well. So I really appreciate that because uh, it's definitely helpful to our clinical practice and understanding of MSK issues in, the, in these populations that we see. Oftentimes primary care will be first line and uh, it's really helpful to know what are the next steps, when should we be worried, refer on, and that kind of imaging to choose how to advocate best for our patients. So I wanna thank everyone for joining. Um, you'll be sent an email containing a link to the participant evaluation um, survey tomorrow. So please take time to complete the survey. And then you have the option to indicate if you'd like to have a certificate of participation. Um, this is for CME in particular. So if you click yes, you'll get another link to input your email so that um, your evaluation remains anonymous. Alternatively, you can also reach out to our research coordinator to receive uh, your certificate of participation, and her address is in the chat. It's Kristen, and, uh, and she can also be reached with any questions or concerns about this as well. Um, so I want to thank again everyone for your participation engagement over the, the past year, or if you're just on for the first time today, welcome and thank you for participating, and wish everyone a happy holiday season. And Thanks again, Femi. Truly an honor to have you on the call today. My pleasure.